to begin with, I'd like to give uh, all of you a little bit of context uh, for the subject. We all know what the bridge is, but uh, to give a bit of context, bridges can be very, very different in nature and in purpose. Uh, both pictures here show a bridge. On the left, you have a simple log, and on the right is the Akashi Kaiko bridge in Japan, which is currently the longest span in the world. Both are bridges, but, both, but uh, the two of them required quite different amount of, of care and skill to construct. They, they, they serve quite a different number of people, and, and the design process for them was quite different. So what is the purpose of the bridge? Is it as simple as going from A to B? Is it to carry these heavy vehicles that we drive, the cars, the trains? Or is it a bit more? To me, the bridge is something that connects people, communities, and businesses. Because first of all, we build anything is to serve the society and serve the, the people we know and people we love. So it's, it's, a, it's a very philosophical question, and you think it, it's not very related to engineering. But it's very important and it's increasingly important for engineers to understand the social and, and environmental context of what we design. Otherwise, we end up with structures that don't really serve their purpose. So the first, the first purpose of it is really connecting people, communities and businesses. And bridges are great because they can drive economic growth. For example, in, in developed countries, big bridges, like I've shown in the first slide, um, they connect people in developed economies and allow them to get to places of work, places of business and to meet each other faster. In developing nations, equally, the bridge shown here is in Rwanda in, in rural Africa. This bridge is, is much cheaper, but arguably it, it can bring a lot more benefit because people can, uh, again, access education, access healthcare and access the market so they can sell their produce and, and build their way up in, in, in the world. Bridges can bring um, environmental benefits. For example, um, connecting the two countries. This, this bridge here is, is a Orisand bridge between Denmark and Sweden. Um, instead of taking a boat or a plane to travel between countries, you can now, now drive. And potentially, if you're using the correct vehicle, um, that, can, that can save some carbon. There are discussions about bridges between, um, between England and France and between other countries. So potentially, there are loads of environmental benefits by by cutting the plane journeys or cutting the, the driving time so you drive less you emit less sometimes bridges are built uh, for political reasons to establish influence in in some parts of the of the world and for politicians to show that they um, contribute to the economy and what about the industry what's the bridge industry like um, often when i when i talk to people outside the industry they ask oh well we have a lot of bridges already are we going to run out? What are you actually designing? No, I don't think that's that's really a valid question because there's a lot of road road and rail building going at the moment, especially in Asia and Africa and develop in more, especially in more developing economies. China is ramping up the the road building. Even India is ramping up the road building. And whenever you need a road, you normally need bridges. Same same goes for the railway sector. Um, and even in Europe, uh, the, there's quite a few new bridges. In, in Europe, you tend to also have more bridges in, in urban developments where there's a lot of things built already and there's a lot of man-made obstacles where, which you can cross. And even if you run out of new bridges to build, there's a lot of structures that are currently in operation that still require a lot of civil engineering input. So definitely we're not going to run out of work and you definitely if you're thinking about bridge design, that it's thinking about the right career. If you are from a general civil engineering background, you probably want to know what, what is so special about bridge design. So first of all, bridge, bridges are generally long span structures which require a lot more consideration and they have much longer design life and, and they're built, unlike, unlike buildings, they're typically built in inaccessible locations because that's the whole purpose of the bridge, to cross an inaccessible obstacle. Bridges are special in the way that construction method and, and speed of construction often are the key to design. It's, it's not good enough to just design a bridge if you can't get it in place. So from the very beginning of the design, you would need to think about um, about the construction. These are typically much larger projects than you would think. There are exceptions, and, and I have personally worked on a few smaller bridges, uh, but a lot of bridge projects are really big, 
uh, multinational projects uh, with a lot of parties and a lot of a lot of um, money involved. Uh, and uh, the great thing about bridge design and for you as a professional is that the structural engineers typical typically lead the, the design. And uh, let, let's uh, re-emphasize this point by comparing a typical building to a typical bridge. So in buildings, you're looking about spans between five and 20 meters. Uh, there are exceptions. So for residential buildings, you typically see smaller spans for, for office spaces. You, they want more and more open space. Uh, so you'll see slightly larger spans. But, uh, and sometimes in industrial spaces, you, you, you need large span structures, but I treat them as a special case really. So most buildings, you're not really exceeding spans of 20 meters. In bridges, they typically start with a span of 20 meters. Of course, there are also exceptions like the log or you have smaller slab or portal bridges that are smaller span. Um, but typically you're talking about spans of 20, 100, 200 meters. Um, that is quite a challenge. And again, the design life, at least in uh, in the European and UK standards, and I think they are adopted similarly in, in around the world, uh, the, buildings, the buildings are typically designed for a 50 year uh, life. And in reality, they're quite often demolished uh, earlier than that because buildings that are built in in 80s already uh, already out of out of their purpose they're out of fashion and and quite often they're actually demolished earlier and for bridges it's, it's the opposite we design for 100 120 year design life uh, but in reality the a lot of bridges that you see nowadays they they've been around for more than 100 years and um, so it's a completely different uh, challenge and when you're designing a bridge you have to think about longevity. You, you, you have to think about the structure that will be there for generations that will, that will outlive yourself and possibly your children. And typical locations is that you have buildings you built in typically urban sites. Of course, you, you build buildings in countryside, but not quite at the same scale. Um, for buildings, um, you deliver th them in small pieces and in, install level by level. In bridges, crossing natural obstacles and, and how to get, get the is, is quite a different challenge. There are various techniques that are utilized that I'll touch on um, later, but it's, it's a much, much more complicated challenge requiring specialist contractors and specialist equipment. Um, and the scale, the time scale of the project, as I mentioned already, um, it is a much typically for a big bridge, you're talking about a, a lot of lead time in development and, and design and construction. And again, comparing to building, the hierarchy of uh, the professionals uh, is as follows. In, in buildings, you typically the client wants to cut costs as much as possible. So you, you, you have a quantity surveyor that, that monitors the cost of the building. Then you have the architect who oversees the intent and makes sure the client requirements are met. You have mechanical engineers and electrical engineers who design services. And then typically the structural engineer sits below all of them and tries to work around all of the requirements and then passes the drawings to contract them. Obviously there are different contractual arrangements in which case the engineering role can be a bit more influential, but in reality, the engineers sit quite, quite low in the food chain. For bridge design, engineers typically lead because the structure is the facade. You don't typically see bridges that are clad because it's inefficient and it adds weight. So the structure is the expression of, the, uh, of visual expression. And the engineers are typically uh, driving the design because the cost is very important, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So you must absolutely nail the engineering before you can talk about building and, and everything else. So you typically have engineers sitting at the top and the contractor sort of at the same level or below. So it's a, it's a really exciting career because you, it's really quite empowering in terms of what you are responsible in design. So to recap, uh, we spoke about why bridges are needed and we already established that there's plenty of work in the industry and we have talked about uh, how bridge design is different from a, a typical building. So let's talk about bridges and what they're made of. So first of all, you need foundations and you, you typically have pad foundations or piles. Um, you have the substructure, which are different, uh, the piers and abutments. Uh, you have the superstructure, which is mostly the, the focus of this presentation. Um, it must also not be underestimated how much um, other items play in the 
bridge design. For example, the approaches. In this, this um, case, the approaches are quite small, but in a lot of cases, you see that the approaches and the earthworks that are around the bridge can cost as much as the bridge itself. So you should not underestimate the amount of geotechnical work and groundwork that's uh, around the bridge. And there's also a lot of auxiliary items like parapets, lighting, and access and maintenance, which all small items, but and are often not as glamorous as the bridge design itself, but they can contribute quite a lot of design fee and quite a lot of um, work. So never underestimate all of the additional items in the bridge. In terms of uh, how, the, how the projects are generally executed um, is you start with a client and the clients you are typically local authorities or your national authorities. Occasionally, you get a private developer who connects the, um, the residential developments or commercial developments with a bridge, um, and they define a brief. Um, sometimes clients would, would hire an engineer or an architect at the early stage to develop a brief. So before you even start the project, you, you, you need to define what it's going to be. And so even, even at that stage, you can get involved as a structural engineer. Uh, you can then develop a concept and sort of the first few ideas for, for how you're going to cross the gap. That can be done by a separate engineer or the same engineer would develop a tender design. So come up with a design that can be priced. So they, they produce enough information for somebody to, uh, to go, go out and, and uh, estimate how much it's going to cost. And once you decided on the cost and you're, everybody's happy, uh, you move on to the detailed design. So this is really the focus of today's presentations, sort of the design side of things. But there's a lot, a lot of work for structural engineers also in the construction, because when the bridge is built, you have engineers inside, you have engineers uh, helping helping the builders to, to get the bridge in place. And there's also increasing amount of work, especially in developed countries, for maintenance, repair and demolition. So taking care of existing structures and repairing and and sometimes it's, it's not a straightforward task to demolish one so to go in more in more depth for the design process what what you typically do in the design is you, you need to understand the design drivers first so that's what i was talking about the the brief develop the brief understand why you need the structure in the first place what are the obstacles what are the requirements and you, you write it down and you start looking at it on, on a piece of paper on the screen or in a meeting. You then define a shape or a few shapes, a few alignments that you, uh, you then consider. And then you start the design development loop. And this process is, is really um, iterative. So you start with loading. Loading sometimes is not quite clearly defined, but you start with something. You analyze the structure, you design components, and you, you typically output some information and you repeat this process until you are happy with the design. I'll go into depth with the process, but um, you, you then agree on, at some point you draw a line and say, okay, this is the structure that we are gonna design. And you, you go into detail and you start uh, designing all of the small things that go with the bridge. So to go through this design loop in more detail, let's start with the concept of the bridge. So in concept design, uh, first, you look at the user site constraints and there's other, other considerations that are involved. And rather than talking you through the list, I'll, I'll give you some, some examples. So you look at the usage type and you have different types of bridges. So first of all, you have foot bridges and cycle bridges. They tend to be a little bit more architectural structures like this one in, in Denmark, which I absolutely love. Uh, they, they're, they're typically a bit more tactile where people, people go and walk on the structure rather than if you're in a road bridge, you drive over it with a car and you really don't notice the bridge itself. But uh, so it, it requires quite a lot of detail to making it, it, it a nice place to visit rather than, rather than just to cross the obstacle. You then have road bridges, uh, which are very, very cost driven typically, not always, but you, you, seem, you seem to have very simple structures that that, that really span the gap and, uh, and serve their purpose. Not always, in, in, typically in urban centers or in sensitive areas, you, you want to, to go for something a little bit, a little bit more architectural. Um, but uh, most bridges you see are quite, quite simple. Rail bridges uh, can be really strategic and interesting. So this is, this is a very old bridge in, in Scotland uh, called Force Bridge. Have, have a, look, a look it up, it's, it's an amazing structure and it's impressive uh, for the time that it was built in. 
And you, you have sometimes mixed use, you have tram, trams and, and roads, road and pedestrians, all sorts. And sometimes you have peculiar examples like this one in Germany, where you have a bridge over a bridge uh, or canal over canal. So we've talked about the usage and now let's talk a little bit about the site. So when you're considering a bridge, you need to look at the site. And as you see, this is quite a different site. So you have a silty riverbed, which is, which is changing the directions and you have a field. So in a field, you, you typically go for an economic, more economic design, shorter spans with a few or more foundations. And with some, something like this, you, you tend, where foundations are quite difficult to design and, and develop, you tend to go with, for longer spans because you don't want to do a lot of groundwork in this very difficult, mushy area. So your site will often determine how your bridge uh, looks where you have open space you go for a more cost effective solution where you have a difficult site you tend to go for longer spans and even here you can see that as soon as you reach the solid ground it turns into again quite a quite a simple uh, viaduct design uh, another design driver is uh, labor and availability and material availability in this site for example in, in lebanon labor is quite cheap and and the the formwork is quite easy to um, to erect so it, it's, it tends to be more cost effective to design, for example, a concrete, uh, an integer concrete structure where you can have a lot of people inside pouring and building reinforcement and it's, it's very cheap. Uh, this structure is in the UK and in the UK, labor is very expensive and material is very cheap relative to the cost of labor. So you tend to go for a modular option, for example, like this steel bridge, which you can fabricate in factory in safe condition and then very uh, quickly install it on site because site delays and, and labor cost is much more expensive. Than, so you tend to go for a more ex expensive bridge in terms, of, uh, in terms of material, but one that is, takes less effort to, to build. Uh, a little bit on, on the shapes. So obviously the shape is determined, as we discussed, is determined by the usage type and uh, site condi conditions, other, other factors. Uh, but th these are the typical types you'll see. It's the sort of typical beam of a, of a piers. Uh, very basic, uh, tend, tends to tends to be used for open sites. You have arches and trusses. You have true truss, which is relying on the horizontal trust. Sometimes you have tide arch, which is quite similar to a truss. Uh, these these you tend to see over sort of medium rivers or or medium obstacles where you have a span of say between 50 and 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 300 meters. Uh, you have bascule and cantilever bridges. These are unusual. I don't think they used as much, although you do see see them occasionally. This, this particular example is the force rail bridge I was referring to earlier. Um, then once you go to very long spans, you go for a, a cable support the structures. The cable state bridges uh, are typically used for, for sort of long, long sh shorter side of longer spans and the suspension bridges are used for the longest spans and the longest bridges in the world are suspension, bridge, suspension bridges. So to recap, we have focused on the bridge superstructure. Uh, we talked about the design loop and we understand how design drivers uh, affect the form of the structure and, and that the cost is important, but the reality is you, you need to make the bridge work before you can, you can put a number to it. So once you've developed the concept, you start this design loop, as I've discussed already. You've selected the shape and size, which has been determined by other factors like the site, the requirements, the usage, and the availability of materials. And then you go, you tend to design a loading, analyze it, and do component checks. So in the concept design, you can have a few different shapes and sizes of bridges and different alignments that you all go through the loop. And then you go into some sort of delivery, you go into the drawings or, or a BIM model, 3D model, or you, and you develop a table of quantities, which goes to the person who would price it. And you, you, do it, you do it at different stages. You, you have concept design deliverables, which tend to be just the visual intent. Then you have tender design where you start talking about the quantities. And, and it, it, this loop really goes around until you end up with the final solution. So to, to go through this design loop in a little bit more detail, um, you start with loading. Uh, obvious one is, is the self-weight. The bridge must carry itself. Uh, it must also carry road surfacing and uh, other materials, which is uh, referred to as superimposed dead load. Uh, it must also carry traffic, including any dynamic effects of traffic, wind, 
uh, we also need to make sure that the bridge can stand up in various uh, extreme environments because the bridges are so important that they often uh, are vital to operation of countries. Uh, you really want to make your bridges almost like bomb proof. You want to make sure that whatever happens, if the truck, if the lorry with fuel crashes, you want to make sure that it doesn't collapse. The bridge doesn't collapse. You you want to make sure that if something crashes into your bridge, it doesn't collapse. And you you want to make sure that if if the earthquake uh, hits it, it it stays there for people to evacuate or for people to continue their normal life. You cannot really sacrifice the bridge. Often you you spend more cost just to make sure, just to give you that level of reliability. And that's really determined by how much uh, the client uh, is willing to put in the money into the investment rest of the structure. You you then also have uh, uh, temperature uh, and and other loading which are sort of country specific and specific such as snow and ice and if you have some soil retaining structures and potential uh, causes of vandalism.